Hello, this is the second part of my episode on Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 26, which I have conveniently divided into two parts for your ease of viewing. If you need to go back and catch part one, you can hit the little thought bubble there and it'll take you back right now. Have fun! Verse 20. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. So earlier, when Peter said that David spoke about these things through the scriptures, he apparently was alluding to these two psalms. Psalm 69 is what this is drawn from, and it has David, the psalmist, talking about difficulties in his life. He talks about being in trouble, being parched. He talks about being a stranger amongst those to whom he should be familiar. He prays to God to rescue him in this difficult time. He makes a couple of references that sound like they could be talking about Christ. Things like, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. It's reminiscent of the crucifixion. Then he goes on to say, May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. Is there really any indication in that text that this was a prediction about Judas specifically and his betrayal? Some people would argue that there is. Others would just look at this and say, I don't see it. It doesn't sound like that's what David was talking about. But before I reflect on that further, let's look at the second half of what Peter said. Because he goes on to say, may another take his place of leadership. And here he's quoting David from Psalm 109. O God whom I praise, do not remain silent. For wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They've spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. Okay, here again, there's some language about friends and maybe the betrayal of a friend. And Peter reads into this that David was in a way predicting what Judas would do. Then David applies all of these curses to whoever his betraying friend was, and I read about half of them there more. So it seems like David is writing a song or a poem here that's talking about situations in his own life, but we see other parts of the Psalms where the details so line up with the life of Jesus, it's hard to imagine that God didn't intend these things to apply other places. And Jesus took Psalms and applied them prophetically. So if we think God wrote the Bible and this stuff checks out, we have to accept that some of the Psalms have a prophetic nature, maybe some more obviously than others. The question that's before us is, did Peter rightly figure out the prophetic nature of these things, or is he doing something else? My expert internet scholarly opinion is this. Is Peter completely right about what the Bible is saying in these things that he's quoting, or is Peter just doing his best? Well, let's consider a few options. Possibility number one, Peter is exactly right about what the psalmist David meant. David was predicting these things would happen. Judas was the fulfillment of those things. And Peter, maybe through a conversation he had with Jesus, had these dots connected for him. And he sees something there that isn't immediately evident to most readers. A second possibility, Peter was reading these passages from a perspective that was a popular read on them at the time, but that hasn't really held up over the ages yet nonetheless would have made a lot of sense to the original audience. A third possibility as to what's going on with these quotations. The Holy Spirit is not yet present. Jesus has just left. Peter finds himself in this strange intermediary time when God isn't present in the way that he's become accustomed to. And so in the absence of that guidance, he just takes his best shot. And maybe it's not exactly perfect, but who cares? He's to be applauded for doing his very best with what he had at the time. And after all, he was seeking God. He wanted to do what was right. That's good. Jesus just told him to go and do some stuff. He's trying to set his team up so he can go and do that. And Peter tries to fill out his roster so they can properly obey Jesus. Maybe you're wondering right now why I'm all sweaty and red in the face all of a sudden. The answer is because I was supposed to go play racquetball with my buddy and I forgot until the last second. Also, I'm crippled with nervousness. Personally, I'm not threatened by any of those possibilities being the case. But let's go back to what we are sure of. What we know is that the Bible does not say that the Holy Spirit was speaking through Peter or that God was firsthand telling Peter what to say here 
or what Old Testament passages to look at. So this could be a spot-on handling of the Bible. It could be somebody doing their best, and maybe that's not exactly what the original passage meant. The important thing to note is that we might have our opinions, but Luke, the author who was writing the thing, and I believe inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so, does not in any way critique or affirm Peter's approach. He simply records it. Verse 21, Peter goes on, says, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Verse 22, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, whatever you make of Peter's handling of those two Psalms that we just look at, I think you've got to respect this. He's being smart and demonstrating crisp logic. Let's think this through. Jesus told Peter and the other disciples that their job is to be witnesses to what they've seen and heard locally, regionally, and to the ends of the earth. You need someone who was there from the beginning to the end. The way Peter describes the beginning to the end is he indicates that the beginning was John's baptism of Jesus, which is right at the beginning of the story, and that the end was a couple weeks ago or days ago or whatever when Jesus was taken up into heaven. So that's what he lists here. Apparently, there were two guys that fit that description. Verse 23, so they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Without Jesus there to tell them what to do, and without the promised Holy Spirit there to tell them what to do, how do they make the right choice? How will they know if they got it right after the fact? In verses 24 and 25, we're going to get a little better feel for how they went about filling out their roster. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. So this is a fascinating process. Peter starts by saying, there's something we need to do here that I think is important so that we can follow through on what Jesus told us we need to accomplish with our lives. Then he sets some parameters, and he starts in setting those parameters by doing his best to look at the Bible. He didn't have the option of looking at the New Testament because it didn't exist yet. So he looks at the scriptures as they exist and does his best with what he has in front of him to consult God through his word. Obviously, he did not have a smoking gun verse that he could go to that said, and one day there shall be a man who betrays Jesus and after after he betrays him, there will be 11 others left, and one of them will be named Peter, and Peter should pick a guy named Marv to take over. That'd be really convenient, but as it is for most of us who read the Bible, we don't have these kind of super obvious verses laying around that just tell us automatically what to do. So we have to interpret and think, well, Peter does that. But realizing that without such a smoking gun verse, he can only get so far, Peter then transitions into some common sense rooted in his knowledge of what God is like. He says, well, we were told to do this, so if we're picking somebody to help us do this, he probably needs to meet these qualifications. That's just logic. But he's not done yet. He then leads the disciples in prayer to consult God and see if maybe, just maybe, God wants to miraculously confer to them the answer to their question. It doesn't seem like that's something that happens a lot in my life, but these people had all witnessed the miraculous very recently. It makes sense that they would ask. I think they did the right thing. Then the passage wraps up in verse 26, saying, Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. So after all of that process, I imagine they paused for a period of time and listened and watched to see if God would do something to give them clarity as to what was the right response. Being deadlocked and lacking supernatural guidance from God, they felt like they had two really good choices in front of them and couldn't go wrong with either. So they just drew names and took whoever they picked. They were absolutely right in that they sought God even though they weren't sure. They were also absolutely right not to sit around paralyzed waiting for a miracle that God never promised would happen. God never said, go pick somebody, and whenever you need to pick somebody to do something in church, I'll miraculously tell you who it needs to be. The expectation is that we'll think, that we'll think theologically and Christianly, and then we'll make moves doing our best to get things right. And we know from the rest of the New Testament and from history that it worked out. Was Matthias the one guy that God wanted them to pick? I don't know, but that is who they picked, and God used him. So here's a quick summary of the things that I think we see in this passage. One, there is a bit of an element of baptism by fire. These guys are used to doing faith in Christ with Jesus Christ physically right in front of them, telling them what to do and leading them. Now all of a sudden, in an instant, he's gone. A second thing that we see in this passage is I think early believers would want to know where Matthias came from, and Luke addresses the process by which that happened. 
a third thing that happens in this passage is that Peter ministers to and strengthens his brothers just like Jesus asked him to. So we're already seeing Peter really recovering from his failures in the Garden of Gethsemane and after Jesus' arrest. A fourth thing that I think we see in this passage is a reality that persists to this day for people who care about doing right by God. And that is that generally he isn't going to tell us what to do supernaturally. Usually we're just going to have to make choices. Are we always going to get those choices right? Well, I highly doubt that, knowing myself and human nature in general. And on some things, there are very clear right and wrong choices. But on some other things, like direction in life, you know, the big life choices? Seems like there could be lots of right choices. Justice or Matthias might be right. The great thing about the way God has set up this age of the church is that even if we screw the thing up, there's still grace for that. God is not waiting around for us to screw up so that he can get mad about things and say, oh, you tried to serve me, but you did it wrong. God wants us to grow in this. And in the same way that we're going to see Peter develop as a leader and develop as a Christian through all kinds of ups and downs and a few really big failures, so it is with you and me. I've made good choices. I've made shameful, awful choices. I'm guessing you're probably a bit of a mixed bag too. But thankfully, before we're even out of the first chapter in the book of Acts, we're encouraged by the example of some people who did their best, had their flaws, and God used their efforts despite their imperfections. I think I'll go shower. I'm Matt Whitman, and this has been the 10-Minute Bible Hour.